The Iowa legislature enters a crucial time period for issues to either gather consensus or fall to partisan rancor. We sit down with Iowa House Speaker Pat Grassley on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Celebrating nearly 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, March 26th edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. Late March is crunch time for key issues in the Iowa legislature. After bills were whittled down by an early March legislative deadline, the clock is ticking on topics ranging from gun rights to voting to our state's budget. We're joined today by Iowa House Speaker Pat Grassley, a Republican from New Hartford. Mr. Speaker, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having good, me. I appreciate good to it. Good see you again. Yep. Also joining us across the table is Lee Enterprises Des Moines Bureau Chief Aaron Murphy and Radio Iowa News Director Kay Henderson. Mr. Speaker, let's start with tax policy. The Iowa Senate has unanimously passed a bill that would eliminate the inheritance tax and speed up a series of income tax cuts that the legislature approved in 2018. The governor has expressed her support of that part of the bill. Are you going to pass it in the House? Uh, well, first thing I would say is the reason the triggers were put in there was that was one of the pieces that the House wanted to put in during negotiations back in 2018. I remind everyone that was the largest tax cut in the history of the state. Tell us and what triggers are. The triggers are so it has to hit a certain level of percentage of growth in the revenue, 4%, and then just over $8 billion worth of overall revenue. So we put those in there. So as revenue grew, we would implement the tax cuts. We didn't want to be in a position where um, for um, something unforeseen, like, like we have found ourselves in right now, that both of those happened at the same time. So they have been in there to make sure that we can stair-step our way into it, uh, provide that tax relief that we want, without having to put the state's budget at risk. So back to, you know, as are we gonna consider it? We know the Senate's very adamant about that, obviously passing that unanimously, the governor has pushed that a priority. But again, our caucus has always taken the approach that whatever decision we're gonna make, we wanna make sure it's gonna be sound long-term. So we're working through internally right now uh, what that would look like, not just for this year's budget or next year's budget, but you know, what does it look like the next five, 10 years? Because uh, we've put ourselves in a position, we've been in the majority in the House for 10 years now. And I think a lot of that is because of the decisions we've made on the budget and the stability that we've brought to state government. And so we want, we're weighing that as part of the decision and what that would look like. Another big measure that the Senate has passed recently would shift the mental health funding in the state from mm -hmm. local taxes to the state budget that was just recently approved. Is that something that can be done in your mind? Are House Republicans ready to sign off on that? I think that that issue is much bigger than just taking over the, the levy that exists at the local level. You're looking at about $115 million obligation that would be taken over by the state. We want to pro provide property tax relief anytime we can do that. But I always remind everyone that the way the current system is set up, we would be basically writing the check without having any, very little if any input on how the money was spent on the back end. So I think this conversation is much bigger than just saying, we're gonna take over the mental health levy. We have a lot of, uh, whether it's social programs or just programs at the state level that we've taken over as obligations that we have very little input. Medicaid's a perfect example. One in four Iowans are on Medicaid. That cost grows every year and we have very little input on how we can control the spending. There's a, we have TIF in the state of Iowa. We built, backfill that for local school districts to the tune of $70 million each year. We have no input. So I think the conversation's much bigger than the state just taking over the mental health levy. Too, too, I got you both raising too, your hands too, now, too, so I must have said something. <laughs> Is that conversation too big to have yet this session? Well, I think, well, 
whether it's too big to have or not this session, I think it's a much bigger conversation than, the, than that's being had right now. So I don't know, time-wise it could be, but I think it's a much bigger conversation than just the focus on the tax itself. So when the 2021 legislature ends, is it highly possible that you will not enact any tax cuts? Oh, I wouldn't say that that's the case, but I just think my consistent message has been from my caucus and then through me would be that we're going to be cautious in our approach to that. We're not going to just pass things that put our, we've worked an awful long time to get the budget to where it is first in the country by our peers. We're not going to do anything that would jeopardize that moving forward. There's language in that new federal stimulus legislation that says states can't mm -hmm. cut taxes uh, and, you, and use the stimulus money to backfill. What's the workaround here? Well, that's, that's what's interesting about it is we've, at first, no one, everyone interpreted it that can't do anything. Then we had a little guidance from the feds that maybe you could. And then the guidance was, well, we're not quite sure now. So I think as session, tax policy is always the last thing that we work on between that and the budget. So as we get towards the end of session, if we can get some further clarity, but it, you know, it's the federal government. We're not getting any clarity right now. Well, uh, what, look, what the politics of the, this ought to be simple. What's wrong with waiting a year to do tax cuts in an election year. Well, the first thing that I would say is there's a growing frustration, I don't think it's just in Iowa, that the federal government is going to say, you look at our state budget, reserves are full, a $500 million projected ending balance, yet the federal government is saying we couldn't do anything to pass any sort of tax cuts because you may co-mingle the money. Uh, I think as a state, we have to make the decision. We're in a sound fiscal policy. We would not be cutting taxes because of the federal dollars. So that's just a decision we're going to have to make as a legislature collectively. But the triggers are already in place. Those can stay. But, I'm yeah. talking, you're but the triggers may not hit just due revenue growth. That would be the one argument for eliminating the triggers. Revenue growth may not hit to enact those. So there was an incident this past week at the uh, state penitentiary in Anamosa where two staff members mm -hmm. were killed during an attack. Uh, in the picture of the state budget, the Senate Republicans have talked about sending $4 million, adding $4 million to the Department of Corrections budget to help them boost staff. Is that something House Republicans are talking I think about as well? It, before this very unfortunate incident, I still think you would have seen a, level, uh, a strong level of support for public safety as well as Department of Corrections. I can't tell you what that amount would be, but I fully expect there to be an increase. We're kind of at the point uh, in session where our budget subchairs are identifying where those priorities are. That would have been uh, a priority before this unfortunate incident, but um, I, I assume that continues to be the case, yes. Governor Reynolds uh, in January asked the legislature to appropriate $150 million in each of the next three years to dramatically expand broadband access. Why haven't legislators acted on that earlier? Why are you still sort of mulling about how much to spend? Well, th the bottom line is as we're putting the budget together, that's going to be a general... From our pr where we're at right now in the House, we're going to have a general fund appropriation that will make a significant investment in, in broadband. And so that isn't as simple as just saying, well, we're going to put $100 million into this without having the entire budget conversation. We've approached it from the standpoint of, uh, you know, and I think kind of where we're landing on it the, in the House right now is going to be around that $100 million number. So that way we can uh, look at that in the entirety of the state budget. We plan on using general fund dollars. And so uh, it isn't as simple as just saying, you know, here's the amount, don't worry about the rest of the budget. Again, back to what I talked about earlier, we look at everything, whether it's tax policy, uh, these new appropriations as a global picture. The other part of that proposal was that um, the governor wanted to, it to be, quote unquote, the best, the highest speed. Um, will that be the um, criteria for these grants to companies? Yeah, so there's two different, so we're, it's, kind, it's the same conversation, but two different conversations. The one conversation around the money, the bill that's moving through the legislature right now is dealing with the policy to what you just asked there, Kay. So I think we're going to be able to achieve the goal of doing two things. When, we, when the bill came from the governor, we agree. We want world-class speed. However, we also want to make sure that those areas where there's one house every four miles, does it make sense for those local providers or the state to be investing the top dollar amount to just do that? How can we do it in a different way? So we've actually, in our bill, taken it, instead of 100, 100, taken it to 100 as far as the download speed and lowered the bottom number because some of these fixed wireless uh, providers, we, I have one just, in fact, it's just between our farm and where my grandfather grew up in between us, is a fixed wireless tower where they're providing service to dozens of homes with one place where fiber has been run. So there's a way that we think we can do this to get world-class speed as well as uh, a quick rollout and hit some of those areas that are hard to reach. Another of the governor's 
priorities was her ethanol bill that would require ethanol at uh, uh, a higher blend of ethanol mm -hmm. at every gas station. That was moved through the first funnel, but has been quiet since. Is that one been put on the shelf for this no. session, or is there still no. attention I, to that? Uh, so I think as of right now, I think you're going to see some uh, activity on the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, next week, I can't. It's, I think it's Wednesday potentially. It, now I've locked them in. They're going to love that I did that for them. But sometime next week, we'd like to bring that bill up. And I think it's. Uh, and and so my the question I've been getting is, you know, why are we doing this? It usually is a federal policy that's where it gets all the news. And I, uh, from talking to the committee members and members of the caucus, you know, we have seen both parties at the federal level. Uh, and I, from the uh, administrations, regardless of party, not always the best friend of ethanol. And so what I've been advocating for, and I think members of our caucus, is that it, we need to stand up and, and send a message to the country that we're going to do what we have to do in the state of Iowa to also promote the product. So the bill that you're going to see move forward um, at the end of the day is going to do everything it can to increase infrastructure because I think long term to use more of the uh, re use more ethanol, you're going to have to have the infrastructure within the state. You're going to see more dollars going towards uh, infrastructure, as well as making sure that we can try to get to some level of a standard and send a message to the country that we aren't just going to tell the feds to always do it. We, we need to step up to the plate and do it here in Iowa. So, so speaking of why are we doing this, how long should state and local governments, or, or I'm sorry, federal and state governments continue to subsidize the mm -hmm. ethanol industry as, as we talk about cars that get more fuel efficient and gasoline consumption well, in general will go well, down? So in this, in this bill, you're really looking at more, you know, the, the, for the tax credits, for example, those are retail tax credits. And from the standpoint of infrastructure, you know, you're looking at, you know, if a local station wanted to get some level of a grant or whatever that would be, that's what I'd be more talking about as far as like the direct subsidy. Uh, these are more through the, the retail side of the, the equation. And I think quite honestly, it's so important for us to promote ethanol within the state. I feel comfortable in us making, uh, not, we're not making those complete investments, but being a partner, partner in that to make sure we can continue to promote it. Why do you think ethanol is such a great bet, aside from the fact you're an Iowa politician? Why do you think <laughs> ethanol is such a great bet when the whole arc of the country is moving toward electric cars? Well. I wouldn't know if that's the whole arc of the country. I think there's some folks that would like to make us think that that's going to be an overnight solution to uh, uh, whatever problems trying to be solved with it. But I think that we can show here in Iowa you can get, you can utilize these uh, fuel sources and be able to do it, still have cleaner burning fuel. I don't think that there's going to be just an overnight. I was asked this question, how in the heck do they expect us to farm, run our trucks, all these things just off electricity? Don't forget, that does take some level of uh, electricity doesn't just appear out of the thin air. So it does take some level of fuel to get the electricity. Um, so I always tell everyone, you know, we have to continue to promote. This is a clean burning fuel that's grown right here in Iowa. And uh, I, I think it's just a clear, it's a very simple choice for me. Another issue that always comes up in the legislature, bottle bill. Uh, it's back again. What's going to happen? Well, here's what I have found in 15 years of the bottle bill. I will tell you, the only thing that I do, know, the, so you guys always want me to share something about my grandpa. I'll tell you this. The first, when I got elected, the only issue he's ever weighed in on as a constituent of mine, not because he's my grandpa, he said, don't get rid of the bottle bill. So I can tell you, as I'm speaker, I, I don't think I could ever allow that to happen. So I can lay that to rest. Do you still go rest. out and pick up cans with your grandpa? I may or may not bring a bag of cans home every once in a while from Des Moines, even but, some of my colleagues. Okay. But what I'll say to the bottle bill, here's what I'll say about the bottle bill. Uh, next week, my plan is, we have sat down since the beginning of session. Some of our members, Representative Kaufman and Lundgren, have been meeting uh, with folks that we have been trying to bring to the table. And to be quite honest with you, the reason nothing ever happens with the bottle bill this year, if it does, uh, the only reason to be is because we've made an effort to force people to the table because every time you sit around a table like this, it's a bunch of finger pointing. So I think what's going to happen to happen, if anything's going to happen with the bottle bill, the legislature has to make a decision what's best for our constituents, what's best for the long-term viability of the program, and just go forward. And the folks at the industry may not love that solution, but at some point we're going to just have to do it. What does that look like? What well, does it Well, I think that we do, obviously there's a situation where we want to get more dollars uh, into the system from the standpoint of, so that way we can have an increase um, uh, increase for the uh, redemption centers, for example, whoever wants to take them. The approach that I kind of laid out earlier uh, in session with the industry was, they want to get them out of their stores. I get that. With the health risk, more and more stores are selling food as you walk out with it. And I think that what, what I said is, okay, let's find out a way in which we can get them out of the stores. And then to get them out of the stores, if you choose to make that business decision, 
it's going to probably cost you some money to pay someone else to take those cans because in the state, one of the pieces that we struggle with is it's not enforced that every uh, uh, everyone that sells the product has to take them back. So I think requiring everyone to take them back, and if you don't want to take them back, you would either have to contract with someone or pay an additional fee to get them out of your store. I think that, like I said, at the end of the day, whatever we're going to do, I'm not sure that everyone involved in the industry is going to love it, but that's the reason why nothing has happened for it in probably before my lifetime, you know. Um, you are fond of saying that Iowa House Republicans represent 97 of Iowa's 99 counties. Um, and you and other legislators have long talked about the lack of housing mm -hmm. in rural Iowa. Um, so show and tell time. What have you done so far this session to resolve that issue? Well, first thing, I appreciate you bringing that up. I might have missed that one in my pre... my. Uh uh, working on prepping here. I know I was I was trying to get in as many times as possible, so I appreciate that, Kay, but you're right. We're at 97 and 99 counties. I got to get that plug in again. Uh, but so that's a lot of that's through the tax policy. So at this point, uh, the governor submitted a bill to us earlier in session. In fact, I just had two or three meetings this week with the Ways and Means, means folks to try to look like what some of these programs are going to look like and where we can provide those incentives. I can tell you, it. I think it needs to be a combination of two things. New housing, but we also need to focus on where in our in some of the communities, like where you know you probably go to some of the communities around where you grew up, and there's those houses that probably with very little investment could be utilized as as housing stock. So I think it's a combination of two things, and I'd like to see us work down that. But that'll be all part of the global picture of the budget rolled in with the tax pieces, because obviously more than likely it'll take some level of an incentive to be a part of that program. What about child care in rural Iowa? Child care in rural Iowa, we've passed. Uh, I think we're closing in on ten bills out of the house. This is, I think, the second or third year in a row that we've passed those. And I'm, you guys, did you guys, you guys are prepping right off of the things that my talking points from the standpoint of you're right. That's a perfect example of what the state needs to be tackling. We've passed, uh, closing in on 10 bills now that would deal with uh, infrastructure from the standpoint of facilities, making sure that we can get rid of the cliff effect so people can keep their benefits as they move into their career providing uh, doubling the child care tax credit from $45,000 worth of income to $90,000 worth of income. So all those bills continue to sit in the Senate. I think they've acted on one of them. And I can tell you that I feel very strongly that our caucus wants to see more action in the Senate on those child care bills. Those are nonpartisan. And I think that they're what we're hearing from Iowans. I don't do a, a forum or a Zoom call with any group that does not bring up the issue of child care. Aaron? The House and Senate both have passed legislation that eliminates the uh, requirement for a permit to carry a, yep. a firearm. Has uh, Procedurally, has that bill been sent to Governor Reynolds' desk yet? Uh, yesterday, I just, uh, I just would have signed that yesterday before I uh, went home. So that then would now be uh, signed and ready to go there. And, and to that point, I don't know if you're going to ask a follow-up as far as with the bill specifically. I know it's been talked about. And the, I don't know if anyone, you know, I know not everyone tunes into the debate on the floor. But I think it's very important for us to remind you, the current, before this bill is signed into law, currently you can get a, a, pro, a permit for five years. And in that five-year period, you don't have to have any sort of background check or anything. Now, this making it optional, I really believe will increase uh, the amount of uh, background check that's going to happen. Because now if I walk in and I choose not to have the permit, every time I go in uh, to a, a dealer, wherever that would be, I'm going to have to fill out that same background check. So I, I think, I, I didn't know if you were going to ask about that, but I want to make clarify that every time I talk about it, because that's what we're hearing from the other side. What I, what I did want to ask about yeah. was, and, and, and the reason I asked about the whether you'd send it to the governor was the timing was it. Was there any discussion or concern about the timing of, of signing a bill like that, given the recent national news we've had with some... As far as holding off on it, uh, yeah, quite, quite honestly, the reason I hadn't had a chance to get to signing it yet is because what Kay was touching on before we got on is we had a couple, the late night of debate and we were trying to prepare for that. And so it had nothing to do with trying to... Was uh, there any... I mean, do you have I, any concern about optics of that? Well, of, I mean, I guess there's every, every, every bill that we pass, there's probably some level of optics. But again, I would say that the bill that we passed, I actually think strengthens the amount of background checks. And from the standpoint of uh, because us passing this bill, every time we've done anything, we've been very, our caucus has been very pro Second Amendment. And we continue to always hear these same pushbacks. And then uh, I, I think that we've proven we can pass good legislation and make sure that these background checks are still happening and that the laws are still being uh, followed. Point. Do you think the governor will sign the bill? I'm not going to speak for the governor, David. I haven't even had a conversation with a, it, uh, with a, since we passed it. It's hard for me, Mr. Speaker, to believe that a Republican legislature would send a bill like that to the governor without getting uh, some okay, some sign-off from her that, yeah, this is fine, send it on down. 
Uh, I think you would be surprised, even though we're all a Republican legislature, I think that we all kind of know each, you know, I have an idea on Senator Whitfer and, their house, and this House, uh, the Senate caucus. I have an idea where the governor stands on a lot of issues. I'm not going to speak directly for that. Right. Uh, and we have general conversations, but we don't ever sit down at a table and walk through every line of a bill together and make sure we're all on the same page. I mean, you, I think you see a lot of bills that come from the House to the Senate we amend each other's bills and do a lot of work. So uh, I think, you know, philosophically, we all know where we stand, and so I feel comfortable in that. Okay. You mentioned child tax credits just moments ago. A bill that the House passed on Thursday would double the tuition and textbook tax yeah. credit. A few years ago, you were talking about a review of tax credits to reduce tax credits. So what's going on? And you, and you, saw, and you saw how successful I was in that endeavor, Kay. Uh, I can tell you that... It's, it's whenever you talk about tax credits and you try to do the review, I was, I was uh, the spearhead for that and, and I was, you saw how, how far I made it. I couldn't do any more than in my own committee. And so from that standpoint, if we're in a situation where there's not gonna be a holistic review of tax credits, and again, it's just like the bottle bill, everyone in the industry comes to everyone else's defense, it's impossible to do anything. So if we have to use the mechanisms we have before us, I think we need to be willing to do it. Um, House Republicans have discussed and uh, partially advanced bills that um, they say are intended to send a message to the state universities in Ames, Iowa City, and Cedar Falls that you're unhappy with um, conservative students' free speech rights. Um, one bill would uh, deal with tenure. Are those tabled? Have you have you made your point? No, I, I, you know I think we've passed. So we've. We've passed some bills, and then there's others that are sitting like, and you touched on them, you know, making sure that we have freedom of speech on our campuses. And it's more than uh, just that legislators are upset. We don't just come up with these ideas off the top of our head because we're upset. It's what we're hearing from our constituents. And when it comes to the tenure bill, as far as I know, we've gotten a lot of pushback on that as a, as a whole. But I think we're to a point where either in session we need to have some level, level of tenure reform, have, continue those conversations. So, no, I don't think that that bill would be tabled. And I think it's bigger than just the bills that we've passed. It's also in the, from the standpoint of finances with the regents. Their, over the last 10 years, their administrative cost has grown 25%, while their student enrollment has grown by 3%. And so it's more than just the freedom of speech issues. This is a problem that every time we try to take any action, there's never any sort of uh, action taken by the regions. Too many questions, not enough time. Aaron, <laughs> we wanted to ask you, Speaker, have you received your COVID-19 vaccination yet? Well, uh, I, I, no, I haven't. I shouldn't even answer the question as far as the personal standpoint, but no, I have not. Do you Why plan not? to? Uh, I just, I have, I've chosen not to at this point. Are you going to take it? I, at some point, I, I'm assuming it'll get to the point where we'll all be required to do it if you want to do any sort of traveling. Well, the reason I ask is that we're seeing 40% uh, of uh, people who aren't, there's a partisan breakdown on who takes the shot and who doesn't. And some Republican leaders are worried that, um, you know, you, they're coming off as being so anti-vaccine, it could hurt the, hurt the effort. Uh, I, I don't, my personal choice as far as what did I do has nothing to do with a political stance or anything like that. So I think anyone that uh, is eligible when the eligibility comes uh, should be in line to do that. I. Uh, I just have chosen not to. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask you about, talk about optics and sending signals. You guys in the legislature have spent years trying to make this state uh, more attractive for economic growth and development. And yet the sum total of these bills on transgender uh, issues, tenure that Kay, Kay mentioned, attacking big tech, that's counterproductive, according to people in the economic development world. What are you saying here to people who say you're you're good, you're turning off people to well, Iowa? I, I, here's the way I would tell. Here's what I would directly say to any of those people in the economic development world that want to make those claims. It seems to be the first party that they run to to fix any of their problems, whether it's regulatory or it's tax policy, is the Republican the Republican caucus. And we've done a lot of things to be supportive of growth here within the state. So any of those groups, and the, I. I after some of these, these articles have been coming out, I've been having conversation with these groups, and that is not the message that I'm being told. So it's one of two things. They're either just saying one thing and doing another, but again, the first party they always run to to try to reduce re regulation and the tax burden, it's always the Republican caucus. It's never the Democrats. Got about a minute left. Uh, real quickly, will you sue the U.S. Census Bureau to get 
the data so that you can redistrict, redraw the map for um, Iowa legislative districts? I think as this process unfolds, we've seen a little bit of action, you know, in the last couple of weeks from the Census Bureau. So my answer to that question, I'm not going to say yes or no. I'm going to tell you that all options need to stay on the table. We have the best system in the entire country, and we need to make sure that we maintain it that way. It's nonpartisan. So I would say at this point in time, every option needs to be on the table. I'd be hopeful that we could find other solutions, though. Mr. Speaker, is your grandfather going to run for re-election? Well, I can tell you that uh, he doesn't show any signs of slowing down according to everything that I'm seeing. So, And if he does not run for re-election, will you run for the, the seat? It, that's a very simple answer. I'm, this is the only question that I prep for every day before I come in here. But I can tell you right now, I see no reason on why he wouldn't run for re-election. And nothing has changed from that standpoint for him. Uh, one thing that hasn't changed for me is the clock. And we're out of time. <laughs> yep, thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Yep, thanks. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Iowa Press at our regular times, 7.30 Friday night and noon on Sunday. For all of us here at Iowa PBS, I'm David Yepsen. Thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.